Good morning. This is Miss James. We're going to do something a little different. I have finally um, figured out where you can see my face and I can share my screen at the same time without a whole lot of extra effort. And I feel like this particular um, lecture, because it is very sensitive and I really like to be with you face to face when I teach it, because a lot of times um, brings up feelings of loss that we've had in our life, not necessarily a child, but other family members. Um, sometimes those of us who have experienced uh, miscarriage in our life, it brings up some feelings about that that we may have not ever dealt with. So I often bring a lot of Kleenex and um, we talk about things in class. And so I hate that I'm not there with you, but hopefully with you being able to see my face and us uh, have a one-sided conversation actually, um, you'll get more out of this lecture. Probably dealing with loss, whether it be the loss of a normal, what you thought was gonna be a normal baby and you have a learning disabled or one with congenital anomalies um, or the actual loss due to death. Um, any death where any time in our life is a time where a nurse is probably some of the most important uh, aspects of our job is whenever we're helping a family deal with loss. Um, losing a child, whether it be a child that we thought was going to be normal or losing a child to death is probably one of the most hardest things a family would ever have to go through. Or even losing a child to an accident is a very difficult time for a family. So if we can evaluate ourselves and be comfortable with talking about this with families, um, I think we have done our job and done our job well. So now I'm gonna share my screen with you. And I'm gonna be a little person up in the top right hand corner. And um, this way you can see what I'm lecturing about, but at the same time see me. And if it comes to a point that I want you to see my face really big, then we'll do that. What I'm going to talk about first is uh, infertility. And this is how I like to start it, is the game of infertility. A mother who was experiencing infertility in her life and trying really hard to get pregnant um, developed this game. I put it with dart boards just because that's what I could find to attach to my lecture. She um, put it with using dice. But the main thing is, is uh, infertility and the measures to get pregnant take a long time. It's not one of those things that is really, really fast. So infertility is the inability to achieve conception after one year of regular unprotected intercourse or the inability to carry a pregnancy to a live birth, like someone who has had um, recurrent miscarriages. So we're going to talk about this game a little bit. If someone developed a game based on infertility treatments, it would go something like this. Once you leave start, you shoot your dart around the board with X and Y shaped darts. When you land on a space that says try timed intercourse for three months, you have to bypass three turns each time only hitting a space that tells you whether that month was successful or not. Or later, do you learn that everything was stacked against you and you're always hitting sorry, you missed ovulation. You continue around the board throwing your darts, trying low tech options for a while, trying to achieve pregnancy and a healthy birth. One space tells you to take two turns or have a laparoscopy to check for endometriosis. Another one tells you to try hormone therapy for three turns. Since you aren't landing on the right space, then you try a new board because you really want to get on the spot that says you're pregnant. Then you try a second level and a third level. 
which is balanced on top or th of the first one, like a second story parking garage. Level two now has you throwing darts even faster and the years are slipping by. You're taking your first fertility drugs, you're trying inseminations, and you're trying a different fertility drug and trying more inseminations. And oh, did I mention that whenever you move up to level two, you have to hand over 33% of that fake money that you don't have. And every time you land on take a new fertility drug, you have to take another turn to see what effects that one will have on you, like hot flashes, mood swings, anger, bloating, or no side effects at all. Or you may have to pay another $7,000 before you can take another turn. And you still haven't landed on that flash in space. And now it's time to move to another level, level three. And these are the high tech options. They're on top of the second story. And by now you're noticing that the game gets more and more unstable the higher you go. You have to cautiously throw your darts around the board, making sure they don't fall off the edge. You're also required to turn in another 52% of your money with an extra 12% of whatever remains being paid with each cycle. By the way, level three is only played by throwing chopsticks. This awkwardness represents the additional loss of control you feel at this stage of treatment. Now it's time to try to land on the ZIFT or the GIFT or the IVF in the other alphabet acronyms that you can't understand. If you land on ICSI without having started IVF, then it doesn't work. And then you have to go another round. You continue until either your money runs out, you fall off the edge, or you finally land on pregnancy. When you started this game, five other players were making the same rounds as you. There was a sort of camaraderie, a mutual agreement, and even some laughter at the silly things you had to do. But as the levels increased, some of the players got lucky enough and they got pregnant. Then others had a healthy delivery. If not, then they went back to the level where they had previously been on, paid more money, and continued with more cycles. Eventually, some players hit the target because they hit the right spot. The object of the game isn't to see who lands on pregnancy first. The object is for everyone to eventually land on it and then hopefully draw the healthy delivery card when the last person achieves a healthy delivery, it's time to play another game. But that one has existed for a long time, and it's called the game of life. This was how the little mom had chosen to cope with um, being, uh, going through all of the, fertility drugs and go through all of the procedures. And even though you go through those procedures, you still want a healthy pregnancy and a healthy delivery because there are still high risks. And so we're going to um, move on and talk about some of that now. And remembering uh, these slides I have put together over the years in talking about infertility and loss because your book doesn't cover it a whole lot. So uh, you'll need to go by uh, my notes and I will have these posted for you. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about contraception, infertility and perinatal loss, more so about uh, infertility and loss. Your book has some information about contraceptives and we will um, give you some information on that later on. These are just some YouTubes that you're welcome to look at. This is the one about birth that we started this semester off with. And of course, that's the way we expect all uh, births and deliveries to be. And it doesn't always happen that way. All 
All right, infertility. There are a lot of influences on uh, decision making uh, on whether or not to approach infertility treatment. There are social considerations, and of course, we have to be culturally sensitive. There are some cultures who uh, do not believe that uh, fertility should be um, approached in an artificial way. There may be religious values to um, consider. And the treatment is often difficult. And sometimes the probability of success is very minimal. And also, as we talked about in the little game, there are some heavy financial uh, considerations and um, the parents need to know about this before beginning treatment. And of course, the woman's age, um, particularly the woman, the man's age also has an effect on it, but not so much as the woman's. Is it primary or secondary infertility? And these are two definitions that you really want to know. Primary infertility are women who have never conceived. Secondary infertility indicates that she's been pregnant, but she hasn't been able to conceive in the past year. Cultural expectations for reproduction um, are a big, big Thing. Um, if there is a culture that expects that that is the purpose of the woman, sometimes it is very difficult for them to understand that they just cannot get pregnant. There's the impact of ethnicity and religion on perceptions and management of infertility. Um, some do not feel that it is uh, appropriate to, to do this. There's multiple known and unknown factors that can affect fertility. They are male and female risk factors. And the management of infertility, of course, is by using drugs or surgery. And we'll talk about also surrogacy as well. We need a good history. And usually this starts in the man first to determine if it's a man problem or a female problem. Um, are there abnormalities in the sperm, abnormal erections, abnormal ejaculation, or abnormal uh, seminal fluid? Because the necessary norms for the male are that the semen is a normal, there's an unobstructed genital tract, um, there is a normal functioning genital tract, they um, cannot have any type of testicular abnormalities or hyperspadias, or goddess or any trauma. Um, the ejaculate needs to be deposited at the cervical os, so if he has hypospadias, it would be difficult for that to happen. And the hormones must be normal. And um, the male is often tested first. The male factor assessment, like I said, is the semen, sexual characteristics, external and internal reproductive examination, as well as a digital prostate exam. Female, we test the ovarian function, the pelvic organs, because she must have favorable cervical mucus. It can't be too acidic so that it doesn't kill off the sperm. Uh, there must be a clear passage between the cervix and the fallopian tubes. The tubes must be patent and normal motility to move the cilia along so that the uh, ovum can be fertilized. Ovulation and release of normal ova must be uh, normal. The woman must be able to release an egg every month. And the endometrium must be in good condition so that it can prepare for implantation. Uh, it must have be thick and have nutrients ready to support the fertilized egg. And if there's endometriosis or problems there, oftentimes she cannot. Lab and diagnostic tests that could be done would be a home ovulation predictor kits or a Clomid or Clomiphene citrate challenge test or also a hysterosalpingogram, which looks at the uterus, the ovaries, um, 
the inside of the uterus to see if everything is okay or sometimes even a laparoscopy. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about factors in the woman, ovulation, fallopian tube abnormality, something up with the cervix or the uterus. If she's had repeated losses of pregnancy, um, if there are abnormalities of the chromosomes, endocrine abnormalities, immunofactors, environmental agents. One of the things that we will do is um, do an assessment, an occupational assessment. Where does she work? What is she around? Any type of environmental factors. What about infections? Specifically pelvic, in <coughs> pelvic inflammatory disease <coughs> or any ascending infections. And this is just a picture of different types of uterus that may have problems with maintaining a pregnancy. And you also have um, a book like this, a picture like this in your book. A lot of my pictures and information I've taken from Elsevier just because that particular textbook has more information about um, perinatal issues. Therapies that we would um, consider for pregnancy would be ovulation induction. If she has a problem with uh, releasing an egg a month, we would give medications for ovulation or do a therapeutic insemination surgically. Egg donations are even considered or even surrogate parenting. This is a picture of um, selected treatments for infertility that you can look at. The top ones would be Clomid, um, usually is tried first, and for some it is uh, very effective. Artificial insemination is another. Um, assisted reproductive technologies, one of the top ones is in vitro fertilization. And then you get into the more high techs. Those are the GIFs and the ZIFs and all of that that's uh, further down. Nursing management, we respect them. We respect the couple, whatever their decision may be. We want to make sure that we support them while at the same time giving them good, clear expectations, information so that they can make an informed decision anticipate things that they may ask us about. That's what anticipatory guidance is. Um, well, if this works, then what's the next step? Have we let them know that they may be pregnant with more than one? Have we let them know that a lot of times maybe only one will take and what sometimes the risks are? Um, stress management and counseling, they are going to definitely need it. Um, give them assistance in decision making, make sure that we're their advocate or get them help with services who can advocate for them. And up front, start talking with them about the financial burden that it may be. Because um, once they get started, sometimes they get so close, they lose it and they want to try again and then it just gets more and more expensive. So we want to make sure they understand that. ART or assisted reproductive technologies are in vitro fertilization, the gamete interfallopian transfer, zygote interfallopian transfer, or an intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Um, these are all uh, technologies that can be used if medication does not work. And this is just a picture to let you see how this happens um, if they were going to take an egg from a transvaginal laparoscope and then put it in a tube to uh, grow an embryo and then place it in the uterine cavity. And they always place more than one. Hopefully they've had more than one to grow and hopefully, um, at least one will take, but sometimes, as you've heard, the uh, multiples sometimes often take, or they take in the incorrect place. A physician prescribes Clomid 
to a uh, mother. She's infertile. She's very concerned about the risk of multiple births. And what would our most appropriate response be? This is a legitimate concern. Would you like to discuss it further? Or no one has ever had more than triplets with Clomid. Ovulation will be monitored, so this will not happen. 10% is a very low risk, so you don't need to worry. And I'm sure all of you have chosen A. We want to um, allow her to discuss her feelings and concerns further. This is just a little happy-go-lucky video you guys can uh, watch later. So now we're going to talk about perinatal loss. We're going to talk. It's. We're going to talk about death probably more than other um, types of losses, but I really, it really stands to mention. Moms often have this perfect child in their mind. They don't anticipate that they may deliver one that has disabilities or one that has um, congenital malformations or one that may have to be cared for the rest of them, their lives in a wheelchair. So those are types of losses too that we still need to help moms uh, cope with and not just send them home and say, well, here you go, you got to deal with it. We uh, want to help them. But the type of loss that we're going to talk about mostly. It's the death of a fetus or an infant from the time of conception through the end of the newborn period, which is usually 28 days after birth. This is considered a perinatal loss. And this can also happen by spontaneous abortion or intrauterine fetal demise. Spontaneous abortion is not elective. It is uh, what we often term as a miscarriage. And this usually happens um, during the antepartum period often. Um, an intrauterine fetal demise, this is considered uh, a fetal demise if it happens after 20 weeks gestation. And this is what we often term as a stillbirth or fetal demise, usually if the baby is term and dies and is delivered, we uh, term that as a stillbirth. Causes are often many and sometimes, unfortunately, we don't know the cause. It happens. Um, anti Antipartum fetal deaths account for half of the perinatal mortality in the United States. You often wonder sometimes how with knowing these statistics, how babies are, we ever have a live baby. 70 to 90% of the stillbirths often occur before the onset of labor. More than 50% of these occur between 20 to 28 weeks of gestation. Perinatal mortality, this is late fetal death over 28 weeks plus the first six days. This is how it's um, counted. The cause could be unknown and sometimes it could be because of physiological maladaptations. Maladaptations include asphyxia. Sometimes this is from the lack of oxygen for some reason. Um, a nuchal cord, congenital malformations, preeclampsia or eclampsia, an abruption, a previa, diabetes, and we're talking about diabetes type one. A renal issue, sometimes if she's oligohydramnios, that is a key that there may be a renal problem. A cord incident, and this would be like a nuchal cord around the neck or a nuchal cord and a knot in the um umbilical cord or an intrauterine growth restriction for some reason, the baby just stopped growing. Um, also, it stands to mention that the loss could be associated with birth defects that were caused from teratogens or an exposure during um, pregnancy that could cause a fetal death. Um, but a lot of times we just have no, we have nothing. We do not know if there's something that's not clearly apparent. 
The fetus, sometimes there could be a chromosomal disorder, a birth defect that isn't chromosomal, anencephaly, which is an open neural tube defect where um, this part of the skull, uh, there's no skull there, it's just open. There could be an isolated hydrocephalus or some type of congenital heart defect that is not uh, compatible with life. There could be non-immune hydrops fatalis, an infection, which we've said a lot of times, if there's an infection that gets into the amnion, the longer it is, the more um, problematic it may be for fetal life. Or complications from multiple gestations. Sometimes there have been multiples, threes, fours, fives, um, where one gets on top of another or one, is oxygenated better than another, and then one may just just die. Maternal factors, a prolonged pregnancy. Remember we said if she starts getting over 42 weeks, uh, the placenta is often no longer effective. Mom who has diabetes or chronic hypertension. And think about those logically, how that would affect the fetus if she has um, a chronic hypertension or a diabetes that is not managed well, preeclampsia or eclampsia, and advanced maternal age, a hereditary thrombophilia, where she's already hypercoagulable state, but she has some issues with clotting and bleeding, a uterine rupture, RH sensitization, or an ascending bacteria from the vagina, which has been left untreated. Placental previa could be a cause, depending on where it's implanted. An abruption, a cord incident, premature rupture of membranes, as we've talked about before, the earlier there's a rupture um, and no labor, it increases the risk for infection. Of course, substance abuse, and um, Ms. Uh, Bradford talked to you a lot about uh, neonatal issues with substance abuse. And then of course, unknown factors that we do not know. Physiological implications of a fetal death. Sometimes if it's been uh, too long or she has uh, a long in pregnancy and she hasn't uh, delivered yet, we can uh, run into having DIC because the longer those uh, components of the fetus are inside of her, it can cause issues. Now DIC, we don't talk about it a whole lot in this class because you will talk about it a lot in uh, MedSARS 2 and 3, but the longer the dead fetus is inside the mom and not delivered, the breakdown of that body inside can cause the mama to go into a consumption coagulopathy, which is she can bleed and clot at the same time. Um, all of this triggers the formation of multiple tiny clots, and but she can also be bleeding from every orifice, eyes, ears, nose, um, and it's very, fatal to the mom if this starts. That is why it's very important that we find out when was the last time you felt the baby move. If she hasn't felt the baby move, then we need to be finding out what's going on so that we can go ahead and deliver. And infection is another implication that can happen the longer the dead fetus stays inside, endometriosis as well as sepsis. So it's very important that baby cannot stay inside once it dies. Clinically, we want to assess for the absence of fetal activity. And if she comes in and she says, I haven't felt the baby move, in the last 24 hours, we need to confirm this. We will to look and see by way of ultrasound, is there a fetal heartbeat? Is there an absence of the fetal heartbeat on ultrasound to confirm? 
And if it is confirmed, then prompt birth is encouraged. And the recommendation is to induce labor. This is very painful for the mom because she's not going to be delivering a healthy baby like she had hoped. This baby won't be living. And this is very, very hard. It's very hard on the mom. It's very hard on the uh, staff who is working with her. But it's important that we are very supportive. And oftentimes people ask, why are we uh, inducing labor? We're inducing labor to go ahead and deliver because this is not a major surgery like a cesarean. With a cesarean section, there could be um, other issues going on and we could be uh, causing more risk to the mom by conducting a cesarean section. Plus, from now on, she has that scar to look at and nothing to show for it because she didn't bring a live baby home. We deliver her vaginally. She has a shorter recovery time. Because, yes, she is going to have to go through the grieving process, but she won't have the risks of a major surgery like she would if we carried her through a cesarean and we could cause more problems from that. So grief, Kubler-Ross, we learned about it in psych in uh, some of our other courses. Everyone has their own individual experiences and their own rituals for how they're going to cope with grief and bereavement. And it's very important that we support um, the family through this process, not by telling them how we grieve, but supporting how they grieve. And everyone still goes through the stages of bereavement. It's denial first, and then they get very angry, and then they bargain often go through a depression and then finally accept that this has happened. And it's very important that we support each of these stages because failure to go through each one, then there ends up being deep-seated hurt, deep-seated um, lack of coping later. And sometimes uh, things just don't work out well in their life if they're not allowed to go ahead and cope with this in the best way possible. It's important that we go ahead and get social services involved because they have avenues of pulling in counseling and services that help um, these families more so than we can. We have some brief training with bereavement that we can help them through, but social services are the best advocates to come in and help because they can continue that connection after mother goes home. It's not required to say these wonderful words of encouragement that we feel like were the best things that we could tell them and say, it's better that this happened now or something must have been wrong and God decided that this wasn't the best thing for you. Those are not appropriate things to say to this mother and this family who have just experienced this loss. Sometimes it's best just to be there. There are no words that can help them to feel better right now. Um, sometimes it's better to just say, I am so sorry that this happened to you because they are the one that has happened to, not us. And if we've never been through it ourselves, there's no way that we can know how it feels to her. Maternal death can also happen through childbirth. This is death of the woman while pregnant or within 42 days after having um, been pregnant. And this is not termination of the pregnancy by abortion. This means after delivery. And this can happen from any cause that's related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or how the pregnancy was managed. This can be caused from hemorrhage, from hypertensive disorders, from an embolus. This can be by an amniotic emboli or even uh, a blood clot, from an infection that turned into sepsis. Any type of pre-existing chronic condition that got worse, 
You know, we've talked about cardiac disease that sometimes worsens into a cardiomyopathy and also obesity. And the reason for obesity is because, like we've talked about before, it carries um, so many chronic issues that can uh, lead to a maternal death. This is a very complicating thing, especially if dad is left with a baby and mom has died. And this is, he needs some help. He needs some help with coping. He does not need to just carry home this newborn all by himself without any assistance. So we need to know what his support structure is. This is an intense grief process. And add to it, something happened to mom. The baby has um, residual effects from any uh, possible issues that there were through the labor or the delivery process, and he's going to have that to deal with or the baby has some abnormalities, or he lost the mother and the baby. Our interactions with him need to be very brief, but very direct so that he has a good, clear understanding because he's very overwhelmed. The family is very overwhelmed. So everything that we say to them must be purposeful, but very direct so that they understand what they need to do. And we have to support their grieving process and we need to make sure there's follow-up when they go home. Nursing management of grieving. We, they have to be allowed to grieve because they feel so powerless. And we have to find out what the family structure is, and we only have a short time to do this. And it may be compromised. There may be some issues that were deep-seated, and now um, there's not going to be a smooth grieving process, and we need to find out how we can support that. The family process has now been interrupted, and they have feelings of just hopelessness. And they do not have to be religious to have a spirituality need. All of us need some type of help. And how we define that is not all about religion. And so there is some risk of spiritual out, spirituality distress. And we have to weigh in on how we feel about talking to families about this before we can effect, be effective. Do you need a clergyman? Do you have a priest, a pastor, or someone else in your support system that we can call to come and be with you? Um, some want prayer, some do not. And we do, don't want to be calling a priest in if they are not Catholic. So we need to um, have those types of uh, understandings before we go in and offend someone. We need to allow them to express their feelings. We need to acknowledge the infant as a person because the most helpful intervention that we can do is allow the parents to be with and acknowledge the infant as an individual, not an it. That baby has rights just like an older person who has died. Um, we want them to talk about this baby as much as they want. Go ahead and give it a name. Refer to the infant by name, especially if the infant lived for a short period of time after it was born. Talk about the time that the baby did live and be prepared to answer any questions. If the baby is dying, answer any questions on what to expect and and how things may happen and how things may occur. We want the parents to be allowed to hold the infant if they want. However, we do not want to force this on them. We're going to take pictures and put these in a memory box. They may not want them right now, but we are gonna give them to social services because I can assure you for every time that I've experienced this with a family, um, they may not have wanted to hold the baby and they may not have wanted those pictures right then. But I'm telling you, in a couple of weeks, they're calling 
um, do you still have those pictures of my baby? I sure would love to have them. So we want to uh, take care of this for them and put this baby to rest with dignity. It's very important. Presenting the baby is very important as well because these are lasting memories that this mother is going to have. We need to prepare the parents for what they may see because sometimes the skin may be a little macerated if it was a prolonged pregnancy. Sometimes there are disfigurements that we don't want to bring those out. We want to bring out what the positive aspects of the baby were. And we want to try to bring the mom and the baby and the parents together while the baby is still warm and still soft if we can. Um, if the skin is cool, we need to tell the parents, when you touch the skin, it's gonna feel cool. Or when you touch the skin, it's gonna feel a little dry, or it may stick to your fingers. Um, we want the parents to keep the baby as long as they wish. We encourage them to unwrap the baby, but prepare them for what they may see. Um, if it's appropriate and we can, we want to wash the baby up, put baby lotion, baby powder on, make it smell like a baby, dress it up and make it look like a baby. Um, and a lot of times they are term and they look perfectly normal. So we want to put some pretty clothes on them, wrap them up. Both hospitals, we have um, uh, organizations that the women either make baby clothes or they collect baby clothes and they provide both hospitals with every size you can imagine. So we want to dress them up, make them look good, cover up the bad spots, make the good spots look good, and um, let them enjoy this time. For severe deformities, we're going to just explain those briefly and very gently and expose the most normal characteristics. They need privacy during this time. If they don't want grandparents in the room, only allow the people in the room that they want and be very sensitive. Many times they want the babies baptized, and so we want to make sure we get these things done before calling the funeral home. And we definitely avoid making the parents feel guilty about anything. This is no one's fault. This happened. Um, we put diapers on to cover the genitalia for any defects, mittens and booties on hands and feet to cover any deformities. Um, we want them to progress at their own speed if they want to look at any deformities. Sometimes they don't want to see them. They just want to remember the positive. And we let the parents look or choose to leave the baby wrapped or unwrapped. And we want to let them discuss the positive features. Who does the baby look like? Whose eyes, ears, look at their hands. Um, and we also want to ask the parents before we do it. Some cultures do not allow hair cutting. But if the parents are okay, we cut a little bit of hair from the nap of the neck and put it in the memory box along with some other things so that um, when the time is right, they can open that up and remember the baby that they didn't get to bring home. And these are just some different pictures of some different uh, presentations. Memory boxes, the one that you see in the, uh, the top left, are the most popular that we use. We get them from the uh, Lutheran Foundation. Um, they're not religious in any way. They're just a company that has always provided these for parents who um, lose their babies. And we do this to help parents create memories because we don't want them to forget about the baby that they lost. Um, because this is part of the grieving process. And later on, most parents appreciate having this little box that you sent home with them for them to look at later. The bereavement pictures also go in here. Um, armband of the baby, the date and time the baby was born, the crib card, the weight, 
and the length and the tape measure that we used. We often used the blanket and the cap that we wrap the baby in. Um, if the baby has enough hair, like I told you, we've asked for permission, we'll put a lock of hair in there. The footprints and the handprints, photos of the baby dressed and undressed, wrapped and unwrapped. And if they don't want to take this home, we save it for later. We give it to the social worker and most of the time they will, they will call and they will want it. Um, we want to make sure we find out before they go home also if they want to have a funeral and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We need to be culturally sensitive, respecting their culture because some do not allow pictures of the dead. Some Muslim families do not allow cutting of the hair. Some cultures, it is very unacceptable to photograph after a death. And so they all, different cultures have different expressions of grief depending on the culture. So we want to make sure we have a good understanding of what their needs are and what their wants are of handling this before we start doing what our usual process is. And both hospitals usually have this one nurse that this is, she feels like this is what her calling is. And whenever there's a death, they have, this is what they want to do for this family. So we want to make sure we know all the cultural considerations we need to know. Um, other support needs, are there other children? You know, they've all been preparing for this. So we have to um, make sure we find out about other children and other needs because they're gonna need help coping as well. Um, sibling responses, how are they gonna handle this when they get home to the other siblings? What are they gonna tell them? Because they have this nursery that um, was put together. And how am I going to tell my other children about it? There's written information that we are provided with. Both hospitals have a bereavement cart. Um, the Lutheran organization has also given. It's just very clear, concise, written information, very brief, but it will help our um, parents, grandparents, and families understand what has happened and help us approach that while we're um, grieving ourselves. And like I said, we need to find out, are they going to want a funeral with an open casket? Because if they are, the funeral homes would have given us really good information about how long we actually can let um, the families hold the infant because there's very limited time if they're going to have an open casket where the funerals can really, funeral homes can really um, make this baby look appropriate because the longer we wait, decomposition um, sets in really, really quickly. So we need to find those things out. And if they're going to be a closed casket, that's no problem. Um, but we have to talk to them about which funeral home and releasing them to the funeral home. If it's a, a young, young fetus and the families do not want a, a funeral, but they want that baby to be buried, both hospitals have an agreement with a funeral home who will come and get the baby and have a burial for it free of charge. So it's important that we let them know that as well. Do they want clergy or do they not? Do they want the baby baptized? Both hospitals have a chaplain that's on call 24 seven that has been ordained to do a, a Catholic baptism. Nurses are always also able to do this if there's clergy is not present because it is important that these babies are baptized and um, both hospitals have holy water there ready to go. It's important to include grandparents if the parents want this. If they do not, we have to um, make sure we acknowledge what the parents want. Follow-up is so, so important. Um, getting social services involved because they are trained in helping families with bereavement, especially children. We had one of the best at the hospital where I worked. Um, she was so good at helping families 
and um, she was able to keep the follow-up going and make sure things were going well and offer any other services or counseling that these families needed. And it's always good to have someone in your facility that you can um, send these parents to. The door card probably equally as important as um, making sure we get services for these families. It makes you feel really, really bad if you walk into a client's room, ask them, how's your baby, and their baby has died. So these door cards, everyone that works in the hospital pretty much knows if they see a leaf with a teardrop on it on someone's door, this means that they have lost a baby. And we want to be sensitive to that when we go in, and we want to be very careful that we are supportive of them when we go in. Um, this is one example, and this is another one. This is one that you will often see. Um, the leaf with the teardrop reflects both intense suffering of loss and hope for the future. Though fallen, the leaf maintains its vitality, symbolizing hope. It cradles the teardrop with its upturned edges, creating a sense of comfort. As seasons change, so do feelings. Just as there is winter and spring, there is sadness and hope. And that is the little saying that um, comes from the Lutheran Foundation who provides uh, both hospitals with bereavement materials. Perinatal loss, we've already talked about this, and I believe this goes through all of my notes again for some reason, so you will have them twice. Um, but as I told you before, sorry, close your eyes, I'm flipping through to make sure I have told you everything I wanted to tell you. Um, this is probably one of the most intense situations you'll ever have uh, working with a family and uh, their grief process. And uh, it's one of those things that we work on ourselves every day. And so if we have some deep-seated feelings of how to deal with loss and we haven't had that uh, chance to deal with it ourselves, it's that much harder to support our families. And I think that's sometimes whenever our students decide to go work ICU and they haven't experienced a lot of death and dying in their life, sometimes it's just too stressful because they haven't learned how to cope with death yet. And um, death is just another part of life. But what's very important with our moms who lose babies is uh, to be there for them, help them to get past it. Don't talk about having new babies right now because she needs to grieve this one. So I hope this helped you get a little bit more understanding about perinatal loss. Like I told you, you won't find a lot of this in your book, but if you follow my notes, um, you should be fine on the exam and if you see anything on the standardized exam because your test is going to be comprehensive. Um, this is new information, so it would be very limited how much of this will be on there. Um, and whenever this happens, we're being very supportive of mom, more psychosocial. Um, some physiological, but a lot of it is going to be more psychosocial. Hope you all have a good day.